Right, okay, let's get this one right out of the way. This is for you, the Capping Cummins. Yes, today I went out and got Deadpool issue one. And it was completely what I expected it to be. It's just ridiculous, silly, nonsensical, kind of over-the-top comic book cartoon violence um, that just seems to be packed with Deadpool throwing out one-liners. And you know what? It actually wasn't that bad. Um, it was a fun issue. Um, I'm not a great fan of Deadpool when it comes to his um, solo titles. Um, I can only take so much of him uh, at any one time, which is why I like him in Uncanny X-Force. However, I can't say I didn't like this because I did. Um, despite the ridiculous nature of this whole kind of setup here, if there is actually a setup to be had, uh, what we have is um, some strange beardy weirdy kind of, he's in a shield um, uniform. He's raising dead presidents. Um, apparently he's not happy at the way America is now and he thinks the only way to resolve it and make America great again is by resurrecting all the dead presidents but obviously nothing goes as to plan. Uh, jump to a huge green dinosaur going down a main street in Manhattan and who slices his way out of the stomach. Of course it's the great, the disgusting, the gory entrance of Deadpool um, with actual a non-team up with Thor who has about two panels and then he's off uh, shot up in the sky and that's very much what this comic is like it's it's bam 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 something happening every like third something new happening every third page and if this had been any other kind of comic book character in a first issue, everyone would be raising their hands up and going, oh, this is terrible. Um, I don't know what this is about. Why is Thor with Deadpool? Um, why is Captain America? Blah, blah, blah. And, you know, somehow Deadpool gets away with it. Um, I did. I enjoyed it. Will I pick it up again? Will I pick up the second issue? Given this week's quite a slow week, and if it tends to be that way, um, you could find out that I have a Deadpool title on my pull list. That's a scary thought. Um, the artwork by Tony Moore is fantastic. It's what pulled me to this book to begin with. Uh, his work on Fear Agent for, um, I think it's Image. Um, I just love the artwork there and it's very much the same here. Very detailed, very creative. Um, one thing I will mention, and I don't often mention um, about this because I never really see it, but there were so many of them here in this issue, and that's Marvel's AR. <coughs> that's that little app on your smartphone that you kind of put up to the page and then it gives you a little clip or whatever. You get kind of a little Easter egg um, uh, of the comic. There's, I think there was four in this one, so I tried them all out, and um, it does in a very silly, stupid way, kind of explain how Deadpool has got his his healing factor back. Um, because oh, reading Uncanny X-Force at the moment, he doesn't have that, yet they're back here. Again, very confusing, but a lot of fun, very entertaining. If you're a Deadpool fan, I've got a feeling you're gonna be picking this up anyway. If you just want something really stupid and silly to read this week, I would suggest Deadpool. So we move on to Batman Detective Comics issue 14 and the kind of wrapping up finale of the last issue with the assassination attempt on Bruce Wayne and keeping Batman away and um, diverted from, from this um, scenario um, gets wrapped up very, very quickly. And basically this is so um, our new writer, John Lehman, can introduce our cover star here, 
poison ivy um, and the great thing John Lehman did uh, with this issue is he made sure that those people who aren't reading Birds of Prey of who Poison Ivy is or was a main character in, um, it, he makes sure they're caught up to speed um, as to how Poison Ivy has presumably turned bad again. Um, though throughout the issue, as he always seems to do, Batman says she's not bad, she's just a little confused. She goes about things the wrong way because deep down um, Ivy has the best intentions but she goes about it in the wrong way um, this time she thinks she's um, got Batman under her kind of floral powers uh, and under her control and leads him to Shandy Pharmaceuticals um, I suppose in an attempt to get him to help her um, bring it down because it's polluting Gotham's rivers and and then obviously the plant life etc um, but Batman never been under a spell and but we realize it's this has been one huge big trap by Cobblepot the penguin himself um, and poison ivy is whisked away um, unconscious and maybe not for this world anymore uh, leaving batman lying on the floor and then a character one more of batman's rogues gallery turns up at first i didn't recognize who it was on honestly i thought it was swamp thing um, i thought what but fortunately, the backup story um, kind of helped me out somewhat. I went, oh yeah, of course, it's it's them. So, not a great comic, but John Layman's keeping the momentum running, um, keeping you turning the page, um, and gave you a big surprise at the end uh, of the main story. Um, the backup story is literally there um, as a kind of, just in case you didn't know, like I didn't. Um, so yeah, if you're reading Batman Detective, um, you'll probably think, yeah, it was an okay issue, nothing to really shout about. Um, but I'm liking John Layman's new style. So yeah. That's Batman Detective Comics. And with issue 14 of Green Lantern, Jeff Johns is starting to go back to that kind of storytelling where it appears there are loads of things happening, but there isn't that actual momentum pushing the story forward any. Um, it starts with the Guardians who um, are apparently continuing to eradicate free will uh, within the universe. Whether this is happening in other titles, I don't know. But if you're just reading Green Line, you really don't get the feel of how big this actually is or how far they've actually got in doing this and how they've done it. Um, there's a panel much, much later on which is just basically a shot of this kind of, th if they are the third army, um, kind of becoming, taking over um, humans uh, and making them in their own likeness and eradicating their free will. Uh, but I just don't feel the scope of it. I don't feel the danger. Um, and apparently no one else has seen this happening yet. So uh, it's a bit of an anti-climax at the moment. Um, they do seem to have this conversation with the first Lantern, who I'm still not aware who this is. Um, but the first Lantern isn't happy about what the Guardians are doing. Um, and you kind of get this he could be a good guy but then there's the kind of evil kind of malicious overtone to it as well where he says you know when he's he or she whoever this is when they escape um he's gonna have his fun with um the guardians um the the majority of this title is um our new green lantern simon baz and his first meet-up with our Justice League. Um, and I really was thinking, oh, this is great. It's not going to be that ridiculous, 
Um, we're meeting at cross purposes. There's going to be a huge fight, and then it's going to finish, and we're going to go, ha 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 ha, weren't we silly for fighting each other? Or oh, how silly were we not to realise? Um, it almost gets to that point, and then bam, straight back on form. Um, the ring flares up after being touched and trying to be removed from Simon's hand and the Justice League go schizo and want to take Simon down straight away. So used to this storyline, such a predictable way um, of doing it. Um, I'm kind of warming to this new Green Lantern. I didn't like the way the kind of stereotypical um, he must be a terrorist uh, because of the colour of his skin and his ethnic mind, uh, ethnic ba background. Uh, I thought that was lazy, stereotypical writing and we could have had him in any other scenario but um, I suppose it, it suited whoever was writing, whoever thought this up. I didn't like it. But the character in himself, he's wanting to do good things which is a great thing um, and is very much a Green Lantern um, uh, trope. <clears throat> it, at the end, again, you get a little tiny bit of Sinestro and Hal who are still trapped in this, in the blackness, um, but there's a strange character in the distance and Sinestro must now pay for his crimes and it just stops them. Like I said, there appears to be so much going on in here, but there actually isn't. There's no movement forward. There's no sense of danger or impending doom in here. And I hope, for the love of God, this gets better because I've always liked Green Lantern and I have pretty much liked it so far um, in, our, in this um, 52 universe. So, that's Green Lantern. <laughs> With Uncanny X-Force issue 33 and not long till this series ends, um, this one is very much a kind of a father and son issue. Yes, it's Wolverine and Dakin having yet another kind of, oh, I hate you, daddy. Do as you told, son. Stop looking for my um, approval, blah, blah, blah. I've read it before, to be honest, uh, and there's nothing really new coming out of um, that kind of conversation between the two whenever they meet up. Um, so I was kind of disappointed that there wasn't more meat to that part of the story. Um, what else is going on in the issue? Um, it's kind of a... I hate to say this, but it wasn't that great an issue of X, Uncanny X-Force. Um, it's, it's that whole, nothing's kind of going right for them. Um, again, they are all seem to be in danger. You've got, um, I don't really actually want to spoil a lot of it, but Wolverine ends up in a place where he could actually die. Um, the, the kind of psychic battle that Cyclo um, Psylocke and um, I think it's Farouk is having on the kind of, psychic plane hasn't really gone the way she wanted um deadpool is just getting the crap beat out of him um and obviously at this point he hasn't got his healing factor back so he's not doing so well um it's only really um nightcrawler or age of apocalypse nightcrawler who's um well he gets to have his revenge on one of our evil um, Brotherhood of Evil Mutants um, and yes one of them comes to a very uh, jaws dropping um, end uh, a little clue there um, I don't know what it was about this issue uh, with only two more to go I'm a bit worried that this is going to kind of f go out with a fizzle rather than a bang um, which is disappointing because I've championed this comic um, title with every issue and I've not really had a problem with it even through the bad art um, of the um, the other world storyline uh, with Captain Britain and all that malarkey um, still the story was solid this was a bit I don't know if Rick Remender's kind of given up he's just it's coming to the end 
they're going to reboot it, relaunch it, um, and make it nothing like my book. So, what's the point? I don't know. I wasn't impressed with this issue. Um, I do obviously want to see how this is going to end with only two more issues to go. I'm in it for, well, the short haul now. Um, but if you were thinking of jumping on, well, don't because there's only two issues. And maybe this will all work out. Maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit and something amazing will happen um, next issue. And then we'll have our final one. But this issue did nothing for me. And it's that time of the month where two comics are virtually inseparable. It's very difficult to choose between the two as a pick of the week, but pick of the week I must choose. And um, obviously you've seen what I'm about to talk about now, so you know it's not this, but you pretty much guessed what the pick of the week's gonna be. Um, we'll start talking about Swamp Thing, issue 14, um, the second part of Rockwell, The Green Kingdom. Um, and <coughs> it makes sense why we had to have the annual um, last week, because this um, the story kind of follows two paths. Um, one is our, our present time where the Swamp Thing is, uh, one it's explained why he's so huge that we saw at the beginning of um, the annual and this is his his journey, his kind of journey to rescue um, Abigail who he believes is still alive and to destroy Anton Arcane for good and to do that he must traverse the um, the river of rot so you get all kinds of uh, usual weird creatures and monsters attacking him along the way it's all very exciting um, very imaginative very creepy um, alongside that storyline you have one year before and you get a kind of Abigail's story of how she survived the plane crash and made it back to her hometown which we saw her living in on the annual um, and the difficulty I have um, and this is a small thing because it, it works very well but at the same time you do want them to properly diverge from each other now but the book coupled with Animal Man as well, they follow very similar story beats and to an extent it does feel like you're reading the same book, uh, just different characters but it's the same narrative which is a shame, I know it, it's, it's kind of clever if you think about it um, and their paths are clearly going to join back at the end where you're probably going to have this rot finale um, but as much as I'm loving Rot World, the storyline crossover I'm looking forward to it finishing so these guys can go their separate ways have their own stories and so the reader doesn't feel as if they're I suppose you're getting a feeling of deja vu almost. Um, there's a kind of cliffhanger at the end, a bit of a oh, because you see a little trident come out of the of the water, and you think it's going to be somebody, but it's actually not. Um, the artwork by Yannick Paquette is gorgeous as ever and he can give um, Stephen Pugh and Travel Foreman a run for their money for creating um, really gross out creepy looking creatures um, especially liked the kind of the the artwork on his like little dream sequences with the kind of little baby swamp thing and um, the kind of childlike skeletal Abigail um, that was very nice. Uh, by no means a bad book. Um, the momentum is definitely going forward. Um, things are happening. We're getting uh, this kind of one year gap um, filled in gradually at what happened and how everyone's been taken over and everything's basically gone to hell. Great book. 
always the fun to be had with Swamp Thing. So pick of the week is obviously Animal Man, uh, issue 14, here we go. Um, and it was just by the skin of its teeth, really. Um, um, because like I said in the last, um, what I said about Swamp Thing um, goes just the same for Animal Man. The, the story narratives are following a very similar beat and the, the progression of the story is practically identical. Um, here we have the two concurrent, uh, running concurrent stories, um, Animal Man, Buddy Baker, uh, immediately thrown into a battle with um, the kind of rock creatures and all our hero superheroes that we know that have been taken over by the rot. Um, and these are all being led by, of all people, Faust. Um, Faust hasn't been taken over by the rot, clearly because he's done a deal with them um, to keep his, well, yeah, great looks. Uh, the funny thing um, about what I found out about this um, kind of battle scene is all the superheroes, if you notice, that have been changed by the rot, you've got um, Grifter, Deathstroke, Hawk and Dove, all cancelled titles. I know I don't know if this is um, Jeff Lemire and um, Stephen Pugh having a bit of a a laugh um, at these titles' expenses. I don't know, but it just seemed a bit coincidental that these characters were at the for at the forefront. Um, but they they push them back not before Faust can leave a message going. Ah ah ah! We have we've got Maxine. You should come and get her. And it's clearly a trap. But obviously because of the storyline to progress, Buddy Baker has to go and rescue her. Um, and obviously this is how Animal Man and Swamp Thing are gonna join paths again. Um, <clears throat> so we have our band of merry men. Um, marching on to find Anton Arcane through um, these kind of rock world. So you've got Black Orchid, you've got Steel, you've got Beast Boy and you've got Constantine um, trekking over to find Anton Arcane. The story uh, running concurrently on it is the story of Maxine. This is the one year earlier um, before all the crap hit the fan. And unfortunately, Mommy Dearest, Brother Dearest and Granny Dearest have been taken over by the rot and Maxine has to run and escape um, from being captured and taken over by the rot too. And she thinks she finds an ally. Um, she's going through the city that they've just left and she finds one little boy left on his own who doesn't appear to be affected by the rot. And she thinks she's found, well, someone to help her. How wrong was she? Um, the thing that, I mean, let's, the artwork as always, uh, the artwork, let's not say always. Uh, Stephen Pugh, you can tell when he's doing the artwork, uh, the crazy dead rot people, um, the gnarly, the gross out the creepiness of it all. Um, there are moments when I can see um, Timothy Green the second artwork creeping in and they kind of clash a little bit. Not as noticeable. I noticed it more when I was looking through it again um, because the action goes on so quickly um, and you're racing to get to the next page that it doesn't really matter as much. Um, but I think the thing that tipped this for me um, as pick of the week was its kind of cliffhanger ending. Now I'm not gonna spoil it for you, but I didn't see this one coming at all. Um, a nice little twist. Why, uh, why aren't they rock people? It was just uh, a wow. My, my mouth did actually go, Oh, okay. So I'm excited to see where this is going next and that's why it gets that extra little thumbs up from me as pick of the week. Please hang up and try again.